How many Old Testament prophecies do we see fulfilled already in this first chapter? What is the point of genealogies? Why are these boring lists of names even in the Bible at all? Was Jesus's mom seriously a virgin when she gave birth to him? Because that doesn't really sound like it's possible. All of these questions and many more will be answered here shortly. So stick around for just a few minutes and let's talk about the Bible. Hey everybody, welcome to Let's Talk About the Bible. My name is Nikki, and I hope that you are ready and excited to talk about the Bible with me today because that is what we do here. In fact, it's pretty much all we do here. We talk about the Bible, and I know that I am ready and excited to talk about the Bible with y'all today, more specifically to talk about Matthew chapter 1 today. That's right, our focus for today is going to be Matthew chapter 1. So I would recommend you, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew chapter 1. I would actually recommend that you go ahead and read Matthew chapter 1. It's not a long chapter. I'd go ahead and pause this video, read Matthew chapter 1, and then watch this video, and we'll go through and we'll talk about what you just read, and we'll kind of dive deeper into some of it, explain some of it, and it'll help you kind of understand everything you just read a little bit more. Now, I do want to preface this very quickly by saying in my last video, we spent about half an hour talking about the context of this book as a whole. We really talked about the background of the New Testament as a whole, and, and more specifically, we talked a lot about the background of this, this book, the Gospel of Matthew as a whole, and so I would highly recommend you go watch that video first before this one if you have not already. I'm not saying that because I want you to watch more of my videos and I want to get more views from you. That's not my my motives at all. My motives are us having the most beneficial and educational experience possible in our conversations about the Bible. And we can't even begin to understand what Matthew is saying in and through the words he wrote until we understand the context and the background. That's why I made that video in the first place. So I would recommend if you haven't already, pause this video, go watch that that video. The link's down below in my description. You can go down there and click on it. It'll take you straight to that video. Watch it and then come back and watch this video, okay? I promise you, it'll be worth it. So without further ado, let's talk about Matthew chapter one. Now, I like to start by splitting these chapters up into smaller sections, sort of like an outline almost, so that we can have kind of a systematic way of talking about this chapter and kind of breaking it down in our minds. It's easier that way. You know, we're going to be, we're talking about an entire chapter in each video in most of these videos. So that's a lot to cover. Most of the time, if I was preaching through Matthew, like in, in a church, I wouldn't preach on an entire chapter in one Sunday, right? It's just too much. We'd break it down into sections and go section by section. For the sake of these videos and this channel, we're going to be doing a chapter per video. But I do like to break it down into smaller sections, kind of make an outline of sorts. And lucky for us, this, this chapter is very easy to split into smaller sections. It actually splits right in half, pretty much. The first section of this chapter is verses 1 through 17. And this first half of this chapter shows us Jesus' human origins, where he came from on the human side of things. Then the second half of the chapter, verses 18 through 25, they show us Jesus's divine origins, where he came from on the godly and heavenly side of things. See, Jesus was the son of God, okay? So he was fully God, but he also came to earth and became one of us. He was also fully man. He was both 100% God and 100% man simultaneously at the exact same time. Now, I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I know that that math isn't really adding up, right? And honestly, it probably never will fully make sense. Matthew doesn't try to explain it to us because it doesn't make sense to any of us. But what Matthew does show us in this first chapter is how this happened and how this took place. So let's first look at verses 1 through 17. I got my Bible right here. Let's look at verses 1 through 17. And we call this first section, these 17 verses, we call this the genealogy of Jesus. That's right, the genealogy of Jesus. Now, let's press pause. Big word alert. Big word alert. What's a genealogy? What does that mean? A genealogy is simply a record of family lineage, one's ancestral line. That's all it is. So you may think of like a family tree, right? You may have seen a family tree of yours. I, I When I was younger in, in school, I'm pretty sure we had to do a family tree where it's like me and my siblings and then our parents and their siblings and their parents, their siblings, their, and it kind of gets bigger and bigger as it goes out. Well, that's what a, that's a, a, a type of genealogy. However, the genealogies in the Bible didn't exactly look like that because it only included the men. So it would have been like Jesus, then his father, then his father, then his father, and his father. If I had a genealogy in front of me of, of my, like my family lineage, it would look, it would be a piece of paper with me, my dad, my granddad, my great granddad, my great great granddad, my great 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 granddad, and so on and so forth. That's all it is. That, that's, that's a genealogy. It's a record of family lineage. So when we talk about the genealogy of Jesus, that's all we're talking about. This shows us where Jesus came from on the human side of things. Now, I know what you might be thinking because I thought the exact same thing when I first read the Gospel of Matthew for the very first time. 
Why in the world would Matthew start off his gospel with this boring list of names? Why would he do that? Right. I, you know, I remember when I was in middle school and high school and when I was being taught how to write essays and write papers. And one of the very first things they taught me was when you start off your paper, you want to start it off with something interesting. Right. You want to start it off with something that's going to grab the attention of the reader and pull them in so that it then convicts them and makes them want to read the rest of your paper. Right. Seems like Matthew kind of went for the opposite approach. Right. Like It, it really does feel that way sometimes. I, I've, I've heard stories of people who pick up a Bible and someone told them you know, start in the New Testament if you never read the Bible and they open their Bible in the New Testament, they start reading in Matthew and they get about halfway through this genealogy and then they put the Bible down. They say, yeah, I'm done with this. This isn't for me, right? I've heard stories of that happening to people and that breaks my heart, but like it it, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, why would Matthew start his gospel with this boring list of names? Why would he do that? Well, we must first answer why did Matthew write his gospel in the first place, right? Why did he write it in the first place? For the long answer, go watch my last video on the on the context and background of this book. But for the short answer, Matthew wrote this book to a primarily Jewish audience to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. That he was the one who had been prophesied about for centuries and centuries and centuries throughout the entire Old Testament. But you know what? Let's get even more specific than that, okay? Matthew wrote with a specific emphasis on presenting Jesus as a king, okay? In my last video, we talked about four different major themes of this gospel, and one of the themes we talked about was the kingdom of heaven and the kingship of Jesus, because that's a major theme in this gospel. Matthew very clearly wanted to portray Jesus as a king, and that's actually one of the things that differentiates each of the gospels from the other three, right? That's one of the things that makes them different, was each of the different gospel writers wanted to emphasize different aspects of Jesus's life and ministry. In Matthew, for example, he presents Jesus as a king, like very clearly. None of them contradict each other. They don't change the story. They just emphasize different aspects of Jesus's life and ministry. And Matthew very clearly wanted to portray Jesus as a king. And we'll see evidence of that very quickly as we begin to progress through this gospel. There were numerous prophecies in the Old Testament that referred to the Messiah as being a king. One of the very clearest references to the kingship of the Messiah is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God tells David that his lineage, his royal line, would reign on the throne of Israel for literally eternity, forever, right? And obviously, he's implying that the Messiah would come from the royal line of David because there's no human who could reign on the throne of Israel forever. So we asked ourselves, why would Matthew begin his book with this boring and monotonous list of names? And the answer is because this boring and monotonous list of names was proof that Jesus was a descendant of King David, that he descended from the royal line just as it was prophesied in the Old Testament. You see, Matthew knew what he was doing, okay? Matthew was not dumb. Matthew knew that the only way that any Jewish man or woman would even listen to his argument for Jesus being the Messiah was for him to start by showing them that Jesus actually did descend from the royal line of David, right? Immediately, he gives his argument some credibility because I I guarantee you, we don't know this for a fact, but I guarantee you there were skeptical Jews back in that day who opened the gospel of Matthew and they started reading and the very first thing they read was this genealogy and instead of closing it and saying, I don't want to read a list of names. That's not what they said. What they said was, hmm, okay, wow. Well, it does look like this Jesus guy was descended from the royal line of King David. Okay, well, he does fulfill that prophecy at least. He checks off that box. Okay, you know, I'm not convinced yet. I'm still a little skeptical, but you know what? Let me keep reading and let me see what else Matthew has to say about this Jesus guy. You see, it, it gave his argument somewhere to start. It made his argument credible from the jump and it grabbed their attention, right? It may not grab ours today, but we have to remember it wasn't originally written for us. For the original audience he wrote it to, it definitely grabbed their attention. What appears to us today to just be a boring list of names, to them, his original audience, it was the best attention grabber he possibly could have written at the very beginning of his book. I hope that that answers why Matthew decided to open his book with this genealogy. I hope you understand better now why Matthew decided to kick off his gospel with this boring list of names. Now, at this point, I've probably referred to this genealogy as a boring list of names probably 10 times already. Um, and, And honestly, the reason I say that is because that is the general consensus, right? Like that's, that is understandable. I don't think that, but that's what most people do think. Like I said, There are people who have opened the Bible, started reading Matthew, and they've put it down and they won't open it again because they think the entire Bible is just boring and it's just lists of names. In fact, most people would tell you if an unbeliever asked them, hey, I want to read the Bible for the first time, or a new believer 
where should I start? They want you to start in the New Testament, but they wouldn't just say start in the New Testament because they don't want people to have to start in Matthew. They would say, go read the Gospel of Mark or go read the Gospel of John or something like that. And honestly, I would probably do the same if someone was going to be reading the Bible on their own. I would probably say, go read Mark, go read John. The difference is I do hope that in and through these videos and in and through this ministry on this YouTube channel, I do hope there are people who read through the Bible for the first time. However, we're doing it together here, right? I'm sort of... I, we're doing the, I'm doing this with you. I'm guiding you through it step by step. So I'm able to sit here and explain to you while you're reading this boring list of names why it's not just a boring list of names. That's why we're starting in the Gospel of Matthew at the very beginning of the New Testament. And like I said, it's, this isn't a boring list of names to me. It may seem like a boring list of names, but it is actually so much more than that. Okay, We don't have time to do like a deep dive into every single name in this genealogy, there's way too many names here. But if you have any level of Old Testament knowledge, then some of these names may be familiar to you. A lot of them may be familiar to you. To some of you, you may not know any of these names, and that's completely okay. For some of you, names like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, some of those names might be familiar from throughout Genesis. Then we see some familiar kings like David, Solomon, Hezekiah, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, names like that may sound familiar to you. There are even the names of a couple women in here that you may recognize, like Rahab and Ruth. Now, the reason that I tell you that this genealogy is so much more than just a boring list of names is because this passage of scripture is actually one of the clearest and most beautiful pictures of God's grace throughout the entire Bible. Now, you may say, what are you talking about? That don't make any sense. I don't see grace anywhere in here. I just see a bunch of names, right? The truth is, if we were to do a deep dive into every single person in this list, which obviously we don't have time for, we would see that some of them were awesome. Some of them were obedient and faithful followers of Christ. Some of them, not so awesome. Some of them were disobedient and rebellious toward God. But either way, they were all sinners. They were all human. They all made mistakes. And none of them deserved or earned the right to be a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Son of God in human flesh. Yet, Although they were undeserving, although they were unworthy, each and every person in this genealogy received the blessing of being able to call themselves an ancestor of the Messiah, of Jesus, of God in human flesh. How awesome is that? Only by the immeasurable grace of God did he gift them this opportunity, right? And he even included a couple women's names in here, as I mentioned, which was rare, by the way. Women's names weren't normally found in genealogies, but I guess God just wanted these, these women to share in the, in the gift of his grace as well. And honestly, I can't even think of a greater grace than that. God used numerous sinful, imperfect human beings to bring about this, the birth of his sinless, perfect son. And that how, that's how God still works today, right? God is still using sinful, imperfect human beings like myself to carry the message of his sinless, perfect son to the rest of the world. It's pretty amazing. However, these first 17 verses only tell half of the story. They show us Jesus' human origins, okay? If you look in verse 16, we'll see that this genealogy begins to change. It actually looks a little different. There's this, this sort of begot formula that goes on for the first 15 verses where it's, you know, so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. But this formula breaks in verse 16 because it says Jacob begot Joseph, and then Joseph was the husband of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus is what it says, right? So it doesn't say Joseph begot Jesus. It says Jacob begot Joseph. Joseph was the husband of Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus. So there's obviously something different going on here. There's obviously something weird going on here. So let's look at the second half of this chapter. Let's look at verses 18 to 25 to explore Jesus's divine origins. So verse 18 tells us that Mary and Joseph were betrothed at this time. And we'll get back to that in just a second as far as what that exactly means. And it says before they came together, that means before they had ever laid a hand on each other, before they'd ever had any kind of sexual relations with each other. They, like I said, they probably never physically touched. Mary got pregnant. Mary is now pregnant with child. But before we go any further, let's talk about what it means to be betrothed. What does betrothed mean? Betrothal was very simply just the period of time between when the marriage was arranged and when the marriage was actually to take place. So very similar to an engagement period in today's time, Mary and Joseph knew that they were going to marry each other, knew that they were going to spend their life together. They just weren't officially married yet. The biggest differences between betrothal back then and engagement today is that when you were betrothed, you were legally married. So what that means is if you you know, if you cheated on your soon-to-be spouse during the betrothal period, then that would have been viewed as adultery. And back then, and under the Old Testament law, adultery was actually punishable by death. So they took it very seriously. Also, 
it, like, just like it was a legal marriage, if you were betrothed and you wanted to break it off, you had to get a legal divorce. Like I said, just as if you were married. That was how betrothal worked back then. And it was during this period of time that Mary became pregnant. And all Joseph knew was that that was not his baby. That's all he knew. Joseph was like, bro, that is not my kid. I haven't even touched that woman yet, right? That's all he knew. You see, we as readers here, we kind of at least understand what's going on. We don't know fully what's going on, but Matthew does tell us in verse 18, it says at the very end, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit is what Matthew tells us at the end of verse 18. So we know there's something supernatural going on here, right? There's something different going on here, but Joseph doesn't have that privilege. All Joseph knows is I'm supposed to marry this woman. I have not laid a hand on her and she's pregnant. That's all he knows. I mean, he can only assume that she has gone off and, and cheated with him and she's gone and had sexual relations with another man. That's the only way you can get pregnant, right? So, I mean, he th that kind of assumption from him was not irrational. It was not sinful. It was human. And every single one of us would have responded in the exact same way. No other human being in Joseph's shoes would have assumed anything different. Mary is his soon-to-be spouse. She is pregnant. It cannot be his because he's never even laid a hand on her. Therefore, she must have gone and cheated on him with another man. Simple as that. And verse 19 tells us that Joseph was going to do what anybody else would have done. He was going to divorce her. Um, he, was, he was not going to go through with this marriage because, like I said, he assumed she, was, she, was, she had cheated on him. He assumed she was unfaithful. And it says, however, because Joseph was a good and just man, he didn't want to her to be ridiculed or persecuted or embarrassed publicly. And he def definitely didn't want any physical harm to come over her. So he was going to do it privately. He was going to do it quietly. He said, look, I don't want to marry you, but I, we don't have to do it publicly because I don't want any harm to come to you. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool testimony. You know, Joseph obviously loved Mary that he was because he was still willing to, to protect her from public embarrassment and ridicule and persecution and physical harm, even after he believed she had cheated on him with another man. And while Joseph was still trying to figure out how to go about this whole secret divorce thing in verse 20, the Lord intervened, as he often does. The Lord sent an angel to appear to Joseph in a dream, and this angel had a message for Joseph straight from the Lord, okay? And this message is crazy. This message would literally change Joseph's life. The angel's message went something like this. The angel said, hey, Joseph, son of David, listen, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Don't be afraid to marry that woman. She did not cheat on you. That baby in her womb is from the Holy Spirit. That baby is from God. He put it there. Listen, Mary is going to give birth to a son and you are going to be his daddy. You're going to help raise him. You're going to name him Jesus. And guess what? He is going to save his people from their sins. Man, let me tell you, that is an almost unbelievable message. Almost unbelievable. I can't even begin to imagine how shell-shocked Joseph would have been to not only find out that, oh, wow, she didn't cheat on me, but also his kid is going to save people from their sins. I mean, I doubt he even knew what that meant at that point in time. So we can, only, like, we can only imagine what Joseph's reaction and what his response would have been. But before we get to see those things, we are interrupted here by the first of many Old Testament prophecies that are being fulfilled about what's happening right now. In our last video, we talked about how fulfillment was one of the major themes of this gospel, and we see it firsthand right here. You see, let, so let me explain this real quick, because Matthew does what he does here. He's going to do that frequently throughout his gospel, so I want to explain it to you since this is the first time we see it. Matthew does this thing all the time throughout his gospel. Well, he'll be telling a story, or I guess, I guess writing a story, and in the middle of his story, he will realize that the story he is telling is directly a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So what he'll do is he'll kind of press pause on telling the story, and then he'll insert the, the scripture from the Old Testament, the prophecy that this fulfilled. So he'll be like, this story... Pause. Look at this Old Testament scripture. Look what it says. That's exactly what's happening right now. You know, like that's that's pretty much what I imagine him saying behind the words that he wrote. And we get to see that firsthand here in verses 22 and 23. Matthew inserts an Old Testament prophecy that is found in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. So this prophecy was originally prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. And this prophecy essentially says three things. You can read it for yourself in verse 23, but it essentially says three things. It says, number one, a virgin is going to miraculously get pregnant. Number one. Number two, she's going to give birth to a son. And number three, Three, his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And pretty crazy, that's almost exactly what this angel just told Joseph, isn't it? 
This angel just told Joseph that Mary was pregnant by way of the Holy Spirit. She was a virgin, but she was pregnant. That's number one. He said she was going to give birth to a son. That's number two. But wait, he said to name the kid Jesus, I thought, not Emmanuel. Well, that, okay, well, that's an inconsistency there, right? Jesus must not be the Messiah because the Messiah's name has to be Emmanuel, right? Well, no, not exactly, okay? That's, that's not exactly what's going on here. The third part of this prophecy is the, the most confusing part and the hardest part to kind of understand, though, for sure. However, it begins to make sense when we look at what Emmanuel actually means. And it's very easy because Isaiah and Matthew here in verse 23 tells us what Emmanuel means, right? He says in verse 23, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And the fact that Matthew included the meaning of this name leads me to believe that the name in and of itself is not that important. It's not that significant. What is important is the meaning of the name God with us, because guess what? That's who Jesus was. Jesus was literally God here with us. He was God in human flesh here on earth with us people, humans. This wasn't, this prophecy wasn't saying that the Messiah was going to be named Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel just simply describes and explains who the Messiah was going to be. It's more of a title. God with us is exactly who Jesus was. So all three parts of this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, 14, we see fulfilled right here in Matthew chapter 1. It's pretty cool. I love this prophecy stuff. It's why Matthew is one of my favorite books in the Bible. So let's recap really quick. Verses 20 and 21, an angel appears to Joseph in, 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 a, in a crazy dream and, and tells him this crazy you know, thing. Um, verses 22 and 23, Matthew shows us how this whole entire crazy thing that the angel just told Joseph is a direct fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament. And then we jump right back to the story in verse 24. We see in verse 24 that Joseph responded by immediately obeying the Lord. Joseph woke up from this dream and he married Mary. He took Mary as his wife and he actually went a step further. It tells us that he did not know her till she brought forth her son. So he didn't have any type of sexual relations with her. He didn't even consummate their marriage until after she'd given birth to her son, Jesus, because he did not want there to be any doubt about where this child came from. The chapter ends by telling us that Mary gave birth to a son and that Joseph named him Jesus. Now, this is significant, right? This is, once again, direct obedience. The angel told Joseph, you're going to name him Jesus. And the reason is because back then, an adult male naming a child was, in effect, the, the man legally adopting that child. So if there's a child that is nameless and the, and the adult man gives him a name, that is him taking that child as his own. And that, that is him legally adopting that child. So when Joseph named Jesus, he said, I am legally your father here on earth now. It's pretty amazing. I think Joseph is an awesome dude. It's obvious that he was a man of great faith in the Lord. He trusted the Lord completely and that allowed him to obey the Lord completely. I mean, we should all follow Joseph's example of obedience. And that, my friends, is Matthew chapter 1 in a nutshell. That's it. We just ran through it. Pretty awesome, right? Pretty awesome. Now, as we wrap up, I do want to talk very briefly about the virgin birth for just a second, okay? So the virgin birth was obviously miraculous. It was obviously a miracle from the Lord. I mean, a virgin literally cannot give birth. So I'm not going to sit here and try to explain to you logically or reasonably or in scientific terms how that could have happened because the truth is it can't happen and it probably never will happen again. It was a miracle of the Lord. However... There are many who deny the virgin birth. I'm saying there are many people who, who profess to be Christians who deny the virgin birth. They, they simply don't believe that the virgin birth actually happened. And I'm going to keep it very short and I'll just say this, okay? The virgin birth is a matter of biblical authority. If you deny the virgin birth, you are denying the authority of Scripture because Scripture clearly teaches it, okay? We just read it. We read about it in Matthew chapter 1. You can read about it in Luke chapters 1 and 2. We even read a prophecy from the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 7 that talked about a virgin giving birth, right? So all of the Scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, testify to the reality and the truth of the virgin birth of Jesus. It's all in the Bible. So if you deny the virgin birth, you're denying the Bible. It's very simple. You know, one of my favorite quotes about the virgin birth is by one of my favorite teachers and preachers of the word of all time, a man by the name of J. Vernon McGee. He once said something along the lines of, you can deny the virgin birth all you want. That's your business. But you cannot deny that the Bible teaches the virgin birth. And I, I love that quote. I couldn't have said it any better myself. And honestly, that's not even the most important thing about the virgin birth. The virgin birth is integral to the gospel message that we Christians believe and that, and that we stand on. And we could go deeper into that. You know what? I, 
I honestly might make a separate video just about the importance of the virgin birth because it is so critically important. There's so much that I want to say about it right now, but I just don't want this video to go too long. So you know what? If you would like an, uh, another video completely just about the virgin birth and why it should be viewed as so important to the Christian, then let me know down below in the comments. I'd love to make that video. But anyway, let's get back on track. I think the, the, the biggest takeaway from this chapter is, you know, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He was fully man because he was birthed by a human mother, and he was full of God because his heavenly father put him there. And like I said earlier, because Joseph named him, Joseph legally adopted him, Joseph adopting him placed him into the royal lineage of David, which, you know, was just another fulfillment of prophecy, just, just another sign that he was the Messiah. And you know what? Let me give you another fun fact that I, that I think is really cool. In, in the year 70 AD, the Romans actually invaded Israel. They invaded Jerusalem and they destroyed everything, including the temple. The temples where they kept all of the old genealogies and records and things like that. And they destroyed everything. It is all lost. None of it was retrieved. So there is actually no one who can trace their genealogy all the way back to David ever again. Jesus was the last person to ever be able to do that. So what does this mean? We know from the Old Testament that it is a requirement of the Messiah to be a descendant of King David, to be a part of the royal lineage of David. We also know that Jews are still waiting for a Messiah, right? So what I'm telling you is if there's a man that shows up tomorrow and he's claiming to be this, the Messiah and I asked him, hey, why don't you prove to me that you're a descendant of King David? He wouldn't be able to. No one can ever again. Jesus was the last person to ever be able to do that. Just pretty awesome. It's so cool. All of these things. I know some of the stuff I'm saying may be kind of confusing to you, but I just think it is so cool how the Lord orchestrated all of this and how the Lord brought all of this together. God's sovereignty is so clearly on display in Matthew chapter one. And I'll be honest, we could talk more and more about this chapter. I could continue to dive deeper and deeper into it because there's so much truth found in here, but I'm pretty sure we've talked about everything that we absolutely need to talk about, okay? So, and I've, y'all already been listening to me talk for way too long, so now I want to hear from some of you, okay? Let me know down in the comments. Did you learn anything? Let me know if there's anything new that you learned. Is there anything you liked about this video? Anything you disliked about this video? Let me know. I, I love constructive criticism, okay? Are there any questions you have about anything related to Matthew chapter 1, anything related to the Bible as a whole, anything related to the gospel, anything at all? Let me know down below and I'll do my absolute best to answer them. I, I really hope y'all enjoyed talking about Matthew chapter one as much as I did. Okay, please don't forget if you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button, uh, subscribe to the channel, share this channel and this video with other people who might be interested in having these conversations with us and come back very soon to begin talking about Matthew chapter two. All right, until then, never stop talking about the